A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since the children share in blood and flesh, Jesus likewise shared in them, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who, through fear of death, have been subject to slavery all their life. Surely he did not help angels, but rather the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every way, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest before God to expiate the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested through what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. The word of the Lord. The Lord remembers his covenant forever. Give thanks to the Lord, invoke his name, make known among the nations his deeds. Sing to him, sing his praise, proclaim all his wondrous deeds. Glory in his holy name. Rejoice, O hearts that seek the Lord. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek to serve him constantly. You descendants of Abraham, his servants, sons of Jacob, his chosen ones, he, the Lord, is our God. Throughout the earth, his judgments prevail. He remembers forever his covenant, which he made binding for a thousand generations, which he entered into with Abraham and by his oath to Isaac. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. On leaving the synagogue, Jesus entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Simon's mother in law lay sick with a fever. They immediately told him about her. He approached grasped her hand and helped her up. Then the fever left her and she waited on them. When it was evening after sunset, they brought to him all who were ill or possessed by demons. The whole town was gathered at the door. He cured many who were sick with various diseases and he drove out many demons not permitting them to speak because they knew him. Rising very early before dawn, he left and went off to a deserted place where he prayed. Simon and those who were with him pursued him and on finding him said, everyone is looking for you. He told them, let us go on to the nearby villages that I may preach there also. For this purpose have I come. 
So he went into their synagogues, preaching and driving out demons throughout the whole of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Father Joseph Mary, the chaplain here at EWTN, emailed me yesterday, and he asked me to make this announcement. Uh, Cardinal George Pell passed away yesterday. So if we can say prayers for him, he was a friend of EWTN. He worked in the Vatican. Um, he was the Archbishop of Melbourne and Sydney in Australia. So we'll say a prayer for him now. Eternal rest grant unto Cardinal Pell, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. Amen. Speaking of Australia, I remember I was sent to Australia for three parish missions. This was my first year as a missionary preacher. And I was actually with Father Wade Menezes, whom a lot of you probably know since he's on EWTN a lot, and I was with Father Bill Casey, uh, in my opinion, one of the, the best preachers here in the United States. I actually joined the Fathers of Mercy from hearing them preach. I wanted to be like them, to be a preacher. So I was there, I was kind of like their water boy as a third missionary going to Australia. And I didn't know what to expect. I basically, besides going to Canada for World Youth Day and a few other events, I basically preached here in the United States. So it was my first time far away from the US. So I'm there and I'm praying about it. And of course you have to abandon yourself to divine providence. You don't know exactly what you're going to get into, but hopefully everything will work according to God's will. So the priest picked me up. He drove me to his parish and I tried to get a feel for his parish, whether it was devout or not. I guess there's always this fear that you go thousands of miles from your own country and maybe like five people will show up. And then usually if something like that happens, if someone asks, how did it go? Well, you'll say something like, well, God wanted whoever showed up there. Even though it was five people, we say something like that. If it's like a huge number, we'll, we'll definitely say the amount of people that were there. So I was trying to get a feel and I asked, well, Father, do you, do you all pray the rosary at your parish? Obviously, true devotion to Mary leads us to the Eucharist. And he was just like, no worries. He, he got a feel that I was trying to get a feel for his parish. So every question I asked, he basically dodged uh, the question just for me to basically be relaxed. So eventually, I started preaching the parish mission. And thanks be to God, it was a full church. And every day, more people showed up. Now, the one thing about that mission, one of my favorite missions in Australia, my first mission there, um, I was the only priest to hear confessions. I'm not sure why he didn't help me out. Usually, the people at the mission like to go to the missionary as opposed to their parish priest. So I'm guessing, I don't know, three to 400 people, and I was the only priest to hear confessions. So of course, I heard hours and hours of confessions, which is good, but I was obviously very tired. And then I had to preach another mission. And then after the second mission, I was just like, I'm going to need a little rest before the third mission, even though I had to go to Perth, which was on the other side of Australia. So I had a cousin who just recently moved to Australia, and I hadn't seen him in about five to 10 years since joining religious life. So I got his number and I called him up and I said, well, I want to recreate. I want to relax a little bit before I get to my next mission. I haven't seen you. I haven't met your wife, your children yet. Do you want to go to Sydney and spend a little time together? And he said, that, that would be great. Now, as a missionary priest, I obviously didn't have a parish to offer mass in, but I like to offer mass every single day regardless. So I asked him, may I contact your, your parish priest so I could celebrate the mass before we go out to Sydney? And he said, oh, here's the number. So I call the number and I ask for the, the pastor, they call it the, the pastor of the parish priest in Australia. 
and he's not there, and the secretary answers, and I say, I introduce myself, I'm Father Joseph, I'm a missionary from the United States. May I can celebrate your morning, Friday morning mass? And she said, sure, just bring your suitability letter and that will be fine. So I had my suitability letter there. I get there about 15 minutes early. I check in in the sacristy, but the priest isn't there yet. There's only about maybe five or six people in the church at this time. So I'm waiting for him. Eventually the priest comes in, I introduce myself, I give him my suitability letter and I ask him, may I can celebrate this mass? And he says, yes, no worries. I don't know why it seems like no worries was like the theme while I was in Australia. So eventually, you know, we start vesting and I'm there just to can celebrate. I, I don't want to sound lazy. This is more of prudence because I was tired from preaching and I had to fly for another four to five hours on the other side of, of Australia to get to my next mission. So we're vesting and he comes up to me and he says, Father Joseph, the people here aren't used to hearing an American priest. Do you mind, can you be the principal celebrant, the main celebrant, and preach a homily? And of course, again, I, I, I didn't want to be in the spotlight. I just wanted to be on the side to get my mass in. I don't know, psychologically, I looked outside of the sacristy to see how many people were there. If there was more than like 25 people, I would just decline. But there was like maybe eight people there and most of them were elderly women. So maybe there was a temptation to think, well, you can pretty much tell them anything and they'll be happy. But th that's just a temptation. So I said, okay, I will agree to be the celebrant for this mass and preach a homily. Great. So we're continuing to vest and about two minutes after that, I hear all of this noise in the church. I'm like, where is this noise coming from? There's no way that seven elderly women can make this much noise in the church. And I look out and there are lines of Catholic students coming into the chapel. And he saw my face and he said, oh, I forgot to tell you, this mass is a school mass. It's, but don't worry, it's only kindergarten through second grade. I'm thinking kindergarten through second grade, they have an attention span of like 30 seconds. This is just to myself. But of course, I didn't want to say anything like that because I'm obviously a guest here. I said, oh, okay. So we continue to vest and he sees my reaction and he says, Father Joseph, no worries. They're about to receive their first communion, he tells me. That is the second graders. I think it was the day after. So obviously you, you want to talk about the Eucharist. I said, okay, great. So we're continuing to vest again, silence in the sacristy as we're getting ready for mass. And he comes up to me again, and this is what he says. I'm not making this up, nor am I saying this to be funny. He, he says, Father Joseph, the Australian people love Kentucky fried chicken. If you mention Kentucky fried chicken, they'll listen to every word that you say. Okay, Father, thank you for the advice. So now I'm thinking about the Eucharist and apparently KFC since that's on my mind and that's what I was just told. So we're lining up and we're about to begin mass and I'm at the end now since I am the principal celebrant. He's the con celebrant now. And before he rings the bell, he says, Father Joseph, I forgot to tell you, this mass is going to be on TV. And then he rings the bell. <laughs> okay, well, you can't make this up. You just have to abandon yourself to divine providence here. So here we are going into this church. The children are all looking at me. Who's this new priest? And I have about three minutes to try to think of a homily now, even though I just wanted to celebrate. I don't know if there's this EWTN of Australia now that I'm on TV. So I come up, I introduce myself. My name is Father Joseph Aitona from the Fathers of Mercy. I'm a missionary from the United States of America, specifically from Kentucky. That's where my religious community is located. I was just told recently, I said that Australians like Kentucky Fried Chicken. I'm glad that we have something in common. <laughs> and then I mentioned, well, re speaking of food, is there a specific food that if you eat this food, 
you will have eternal life. Basically, you will never die an everlasting death. Obviously, you can't ask rhetorical questions necessarily to kindergartens and second graders. So they're raising their hands. They're all excited. I've got to call on people. So this was my mistake. I call on the young girl there in the first row. Again, my mistake. She says, it's easy. Gummy bears, she said. Well, this is the answer that I deserved when I asked a question like that. So there was food basically from mom's spaghetti, I think to kangaroo that was mentioned. Eventually, a young girl in the back said, this is easy. It's Jesus in Holy Communion. Like, why don't all of you know this already? So eventually, thanks be to God, I got the answer. If you eat this food that is Jesus in the Holy Eucharist, you will have eternal life. Obviously, all you have to do is read the Gospel of John, John 6. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him at the last day. Now, I was told before I started preaching in Australia, I don't know how true this is, but only about 12 to 15 percent of Catholics in Australia go to Sunday Mass every week. So it's a very sad thing to think about, like the, the loss of faith. I know it's not much more here in the United States, maybe what, 25 to 30 percent of Catholics here in the United States go to weekly Mass on Sundays. A very sad thing. So I knew that most of these school children probably didn't go to Sunday Mass every week. So I had to preach more and more about the beauty of the Eucharist, about the love that Christ shows us in his real presence. So what about you? Is Sunday the Sunday Mass that you attend, or even if you attend Mass on a daily basis, is this the greatest meal of your week? Are you looking forward to going to Mass more than watching football? I mean, here we are in Alabama. It's a very football state. Do you pay more attention to football, whether Auburn or Alabama? I'm not going to even try to pick any sides here. Do we know more about our football teams than the readings at Mass? Are we looking more forward to watching our favorite TV show or going to our favorite restaurant? You know, I was meditating upon, you know, what to preach we easily prepare more for a job interview, a test at school, or even watching our favorite movie, yet at times we can't even spend 10 minutes to prepare for Sunday Mass. So an infinite amount of grace is being present to us here at Mass since we're re receiving a divine being, that is Jesus, true God and true man. This is something that we need to prepare for. So even after Sunday Mass, after you attend Sunday Mass, at some point you, may, you want to make a resolution to read and meditate upon the readings to prepare yourselves for the upcoming Mass. Now besides that, one of the best ways to prepare for communion make spiritual communions throughout the week. You know, I think, I don't really watch EWTN, I have nothing against it, but I have other duties. But I think after uh, the Lamb of God, there's a spiritual communion prayer for those who can't come physically to Mass. And sometimes we think, well, this is just a pious thought. Spiritual communion, you can't come to Mass, those are homebound, those who are maybe in a hospital, they may not get a chance to physically receive our Lord, so they make a spiritual communion. You're like, oh, it's, it's just a pious substitute. Well, spiritual communions prolong the fruits of our prior sacramental communion. It is something very real. So let me quote St. John Paul II. This is Ecclesia de Eucharistia. In the Eucharist, Unlike any other sacrament, the mystery of communion is so perfect that it bring us, brings us to the heights of every good thing. Here is the ultimate goal of every human desire, because here we attain God, and God joins himself to us 
in the most perfect union. Precisely for this reason, it is good to cultivate in our hearts a constant desire for the sacrament of the Eucharist. This was the origin of the practice of spiritual communion, which has happily been established in the church for centuries and recommended by saints who were masters of the spiritual life. Now, personally, I try to make a spiritual communion at the top of every hour. I have a watch that vibrates a little bit at the top of every hour, and I stop. Jesus, I can't receive you sacramentally, but come into my heart spiritually. So again, that desire, that thanksgiving of our prior sacramental communion, the fruits of that communion can be reborn. And the amount of fruits of that spiritual communion is based on our yearning to be united with Jesus in the Eucharist. It is something very real. Uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe used to make 20 spiritual communions every hour. How about that in terms of fruit being born in his soul? St. Faustina, my heart is a living tabernacle in which the living host is reserved. St. Thomas Aquinas, the manner of receiving this sacrament is twofold, spiritual and sacramental. St. Teresa of Jesus, I'm using the saints, don't, don't believe me, they're obviously masters of the interior life, so we want to listen to them. When you do not receive communion and you do not attend mass, you can make a spiritual communion, which is a most beneficial, beneficial practice. By it, the love of God will be greatly impressed on you. May we make a resolution to be more of Eucharistic souls, people that are desperately in love with Jesus in the most blessed sacrament. Mother Angelica has said, Lord God, if I truly appreciated the majestic humility of the Eucharist, if I fully grasp the opportunity to participate in your very nature, it would change my life forever.